Use that board here. Yeah, time. just be careful. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joanna Cohn. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I want to welcome all of you to our uh, Centennial Policy Scholar Seminar on Tobacco Control Policy. 21 years ago in 1994, Congressman Waxman conducted congressional committee hearings on the lies, the deceit, and the bad acts of the tobacco industry. And in April of that year, he put the CEOs of the seven major tobacco companies in this country under oath, and they all declared that nicotine is not addictive. Now, of course, health scientists and tobacco control professionals knew that these companies were untrustworthy, but when the CEOs denied that nicotine is addictive, even the person on the street could see the tobacco companies for what they really were. And as Congressman Matt Waxman said during the hearings, any person who smokes cigarettes or their family, or their family members knew firsthand uh, that cigarettes are addictive. So this was a huge watershed moment in the country, and it changed how the public viewed tobacco companies and their products. And it paved the way for the implementation of a range of effective policy interventions to reduce smoking, as well as the historic 2009 Tobacco Control Act. So today we have our school's fifth Centennial Policy Scholar Seminar. Uh, I want to say that it's sponsored by the Departments of Health Policy and Management, as well as Health Behavior and Society, and the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. And you are really in for a treat today. Uh, over the next 90 minutes, our Centennial Policy Scholar and our distinguished panelists will discuss where we are, where we've come from, and where we need to go to move to uh, finally eliminate this epidemic. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator for this seminar, Dr. Josh Sharstein. He's our Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training, and himself had the opportunity to work with Congressman Waxman as a health policy advisor and has worked on a number of tobacco control policy issues. So Dr. Sharstein, over to you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Professor Cohen. Um, it is my pleasure to moderate, and I'll, I'll keep things uh, moving. We have a phenomenal group. I um, uh, want to thank Professor Cohen for organizing today. Professor Cohen is one of the Bloomberg professors uh, at the university, a professor of disease prevention. And um, her, she has done a tremendous amount of work in the United States and around the world in tobacco control over the last 20 years. Um, this is the fifth Centennial Policy Scholar Seminar. Uh, Congressman Waxman is our Centennial Policy uh, Scholar. He usually says that uh, I'm going to take his joke. He says he's a Centennial Policy Scholar, but he's not 100 years old. Um, it, but what I say is that uh, it is impossible to think of someone who's had more of an impact on health policy during that century than Congressman Waxman. His uh, work in Congress included um, incredible advances across multiple different areas of health. At one of our earlier seminars, we had someone say when, when they went to work on the Hill in the mid-1980s, he was already considered a legend, and then he went on to accomplish so many more things over the next uh, several decades. Um, the Ryan White Act uh, for HIV, multiple Medicaid expansions, the Affordable Care Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act revisions, um, and you could go, could go on and on. It's been a tremendous um, honor for the Health Policy and Management Department, I see Ellen McKenzie here, to uh, be hosting Congressman Waxman uh, this year. Um, and as uh, Professor Cohen said, tobacco control has always had a special a place for Congressman Waxman, and we're going to be uh, watching some of the uh, video clips uh, of that um, later today. I think um, probably uh, the work that Congressman Waxman did, supported by the other panelists here, uh, created the watershed that made um, enormous progress possible in the United States and around the world on, on tobacco control. Um, I want to uh, also introduce our other panelists to, our, to, to Congressman Waxman's right is Bill Corr. Um, most recently, Bill Corr has served uh, as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, 
But before that, he worked for eight years as the executive director of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which is a uh, private nonprofit that was really focused on improving tobacco control policy. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Bill was really uh, the main uh, strategist and uh, force behind the passage of the uh, law that allows FDA to regulate tobacco products. I remember one vote where we won in the House and lost in the Senate, and I called absolutely uh, – sad to Bill, and Bill just uh, in his very calm and steady way said, uh, this was a step forward, just hang in there. And sure enough, uh, the law went on, went on to pass. Um, prior to that, uh, uh, Bill worked for Congressman Waxman during the period of the um, uh, hearings, and he um, worked before that at uh, community health centers in Appalachia. Um, to his right is uh, Bill Schultz. Um, Bill Schultz is now the general counsel of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That's obviously an enormous job. You can't pick up a paper and hear about some lawsuit uh, or another that is landing on, on Bill's desk, but it's really uh, fantastic that both bills, bills came up today. Um, Bill has also served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Department of Justice, where he was responsible for overseeing the tobacco litigation team that led to major victory on tobacco. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Commissioner for Policy at the Food and Drug Administration um, and was responsible for uh, all significant policy issues in the de development of regulations, including the FDA's 1996 landmark uh, tobacco regulations. Prior to joining FDA, uh, Bill Schultz was the counsel to the Subcommittee on Health and the Environment that Congressman Waxman chaired, and uh, he was there for the uh, landmark hearings. He also um, is an attorney. Uh, like Bill Corr, um, and worked for the Public Citizen Litigation Group. So this is really an amazing uh, panel, and I'm just going to um, jump in to get started. My job's going to be to kind of keep things moving. Um, the first, we're going to divide, let me just tell you what the game plan is. We've got um, four sections, and we're going to move through four topics. The first is going to be a little bit about the past, achieving the ability to regulate tobacco products. And we're going to talk about the history of the hearing and the law that resulted, among other changes. Then we're going to talk about uh, telling the truth about tobacco in, um, and some of the issues involved with warning labels and tobacco advertising that have been particularly um, important and controversial. The third, we're going to talk about new products, including electronic cigarettes. And at the end, we're going to look to the future about what it will take to eliminate the tobacco epidemic. And we will also um, have time for Q&A if I can keep things going. So I'm going to um, jump right in and ask to see whether we can show the first video um, from the uh, 1994 hearings. So um, let me turn to Bill Schultz. Um, can you uh, set the stage for, for that, that hearing, what it was? Uh, it didn't drop out of the blue. What, what, what led to it? How should people today think about um, the context for that hearing? So it started with a letter written to Congress by FDA Commissioner David Kessler um, on February 25th, uh, 1994. Uh, he had previously received a petition from a tobacco control group asking FDA to regulate tobacco <clears throat> cigarettes as a drug. The agency had turned that down uh, uh, previously, but he put together a group of lawyers and policymakers to look at the issue, and he he then uh, decided to draft a letter saying uh, they had evidence that uh, uh, nicotine was addictive, that tobacco companies added nicotine, and they were going to launch an investigation and. Uh, if it all turned out true, uh, tobacco would be a drug. Interestingly, I, I looked at his book the other night, and he went to Bill Corr to get the letter cleared through the administration. Bill Corr was, uh, was uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services, and um, uh, in a dramatic moment, he describes how Bill told him it was cleared. He sent it up to Congress, and in, at the end of the letter, and I think this was probably uh, needed to get it cleared, it kind of indicated that Congress had some role in this. It didn't quite say FDA would wait for Congress, but it was, it was sort of like we're going to do this jointly. Um, immediately, 
uh, Congressman Waxman announced he was going to have hearings. Now, interestingly, he was the chairman of the Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. I was, uh, I was his FDA staffer. That was my connection to this. It wasn't tobacco. And uh, uh, this is a legislative committee that passed legislation. I don't think anybody uh, really thought there was going to be any immediate legislation in this area. The committee had kind of been uh, stacked by the tobacco industry. It was very hard to move legislation. But as a legislative committee, he also had the ability to do oversight hearings, and that's really what this was going to be. Um, and so that launched a series of hearings, including the one that, that you just saw. And it's interesting, uh, when we got to that hearing, and we're talking about, well, we'll call all the, uh, the, the uh, CEOs of the tobacco companies, they had, they had always refused to testify. And so we had to talk about what is going to happen if they refuse, as they always had, uh, because as a subcommittee chairman, Congressman Waxman didn't have subpoena power. He didn't have any way to force them to come. And we decided, well, we'll just have the hearing and we'll have all these empty chairs. And, uh, and that would make theater, if nothing else. The ranking minority member of the subcommittee was Tom Bliley from Richmond, an advocate for Philip Morris and the tobacco companies. But he later said, he told the tobacco companies, if you don't show, I'm not going to show either. I'm not going to show up to protect you uh, if you don't come. So they came because it was an oversight hearing. We treated it like an oversight hearing, including having witnesses uh, sworn in. And that's why you see that I iconic photo of the witnesses um, already being sworn in. But the goal of the hearing, and then I'll stop, uh, was really three part. One was public education. And again, there were a series of hearings. There were probably half a dozen or more hearings Every one of them was on the top of the evening news. The, uh, um, everyone was the first story of the evening news. Um, they covered, in addition to the CEOs, they covered the issue of tobacco companies manipulating uh, the Federal Trade Commission numbers, re reports on nicotine and tar. We had a researcher from Philip Morris, interesting, um, who was charged with researching alternatives to nicotine, and in the process of that, years before the Surgeon General report, proved that nicotine was addictive, and then Philip Morris refused to allow him to, to publish his journal articles. So part of it was public education. The second part was to strengthen the FDA's hand, because we well understood that it was FDA that uh, really had the ability to do something very meaningful in the short term. And then the third goal was future legislation. And that's what came 15 years later. Great. And I should just point out that that was at a time when people really watched the evening news. <laughs> Probably like four or five times the audience of today. So I want to turn to Congressman Waxman. Uh, thank, thank you, Bill, for setting the context so well. What was it like to chair these hearings? Did you, did you have a, an idea as it was happening that this was going to be such a watershed moment? These weren't the first hearings that we had had on tobacco. Tobacco is a major issue for any committee on health in this country. It's a leading cause of preventable death. Hundreds of thousands of people die from it each year. 4,000 kids were taking up cigarette smoking every day. And so we were aware of the problem, and we had hearings with celebrities to talk about the connection between cigarette smoking and health. And we had legislation that predated the law we're going to talk about that strengthened warning labels so that people would be informed about it. What was different was that uh, Dr. Kessler at the FDA started talking ab about the spiking of nicotine levels in cigarettes. And we all knew there was nicotine in cigarettes. We all knew that nicotine was addictive. We all knew that tobacco was harmful. And that was the message over and over again. But the idea that they could spike the nicotine levels meant that they could get people addicted because they really are delivering the drug nicotine. It's a drug that goes right to the brain. And smokers say they love the taste. It's not a taste in your mouth. It's a taste in your brain that comes through the lungs. So when Dr. Kessler started talking about the the spiking and manipulation of the nicotine levels, 
it, it followed uh, a report by ABC News that uh, they were uh, uh, suspecting that this could be done. They were sued for $10 billion by one of the tobacco companies, probably Philip Morris, to intimidate them from talking about it. But the commissioner of the FDA saying that he is seeing the manipulation of nicotine to keep people smoking was pretty dramatic. So we called Dr. Kessler in for a hearing. And he went through in detail all the patents that the tobacco industry had to manipulate and change the nicotine levels. They didn't change it downward, however. They changed it mainly upward. Uh, we had that hearing, and then we said, well, we want the tobacco executives to come and testify and answer this charge. This is something quite startling. And we suggested we'll have empty chairs if they don't come, as, as Bill mentioned. But they all decided to come. They didn't take it all that seriously, I don't think, although they worked hard with their lawyers to be sure they didn't have a uh, perjury charge because they knew, they, they knew where they were lying. But they, Kate, they, they, they phrased it in a way that their lawyers said they wouldn't be uh, held for perjury. We think, we believe, uh, our evidence shows us one of the executives at the hearing even said uh, addiction is something that... Uh, it's like eating Twinkies. Maybe that's one of your, your videos you're going to show. But it's like eating a, twi a, a Twinkie can be addictive because you really like the taste of it. Well, smoking is similar to that. So the hearing uh, showed something that I've learned over and over again in my career. You want to legislate, but there was no way in the world we could legislate. Tobacco was too powerful. But another part of what Congress does that is equally as important as legislating is oversight, to check to see whether existing laws were working, to talk about problems. Sometimes by focusing attention on a problem, the problem gets resolved without legislation. This oversight hearing had the impact of giving the American people a different view of the tobacco industry than they had seen before. This was distinguished looking gentlemen in suits after holding up their hands to tell the truth lying about whether cigarettes were harmful, whether nicotine was addictive, whether they changed the nicotine levels, and whether they targeted kids. But there was a curtain, like an iron curtain, that anybody who worked within the industry could not talk publicly about what they did. And that curtain protected the industry. They signed agreements. They could be held for huge amounts of uh, penalties if they violated it. Part of what you saw in that hearing was to try to get them to share with Congress the information they already had. Another consequence of the hearing, not only giving a different face to the industry, was that people were furious who were working for the industry. And we got a lot of calls saying, we know that's not true. And some of the researchers started coming forward. So before I go to Bill Coy, I want to ask to, to Bill Schultz and Congressman Waxman, at what point did you realize that this was such a, a big moment that it wasn't like any other tobacco hearing? Was it during the hearing? Was it, you know, before the hearing? Was it after? What was the moment you realized? Maybe, Bill, do you want to? Well, I, I think when we got the letter from Dr. Kessler, we knew this was huge. This was like nothing else. And I think uh, we knew the hearing was going to be a big hearing. It was covered by, by a Nightline which was a you know the most popular nightly news show at the time so i think everybody the press everybody knew what a huge deal it was to have actually have the tobacco industry ceos appear at a congressional hearing well i certainly realized the importance of the hearing but we had a lot of hearings with a lot of press on hiv aids and other things i knew it was important i wasn't focusing on the significance of the hearing while we were doing it. I was focusing on trying to ask the right questions, trying to get the right uh, frame for the next steps that we'll take in the, our investigation. And um, I, I think we, we look back now, that it was a watershed moment, but when Nightline did its story, it was clear and other with other reporters that the tobacco industry was so incredibly clever their public relations people were feeding the line, here are these executives, they're just businessmen, and powerful, intrusive federal government 
was picking on them. <clears throat> uh, the fellow, uh, his name escapes me from Nightline, Ted Koppel, asked me in an interview, which I, some of which he used in that Nightline program, uh, don't you think you're making them sympathetic by bringing them in and having to answer a lot of questions? So, and then I, there was a column on the, in the Washington Post by one of the routine columnists who gave that same argument. And this was a theme of the Republicans at that time because they were talking about intrusive government regulations, big government in Washington, and that was laying the groundwork for what turned out a watershed election in November, this was in April, but by November, they took over the House with Newt Gingrich for the first time in 40 years. And as a result, there were no more tobacco investigations, no more tobacco hearing, no more talk about tobacco. And what we had were people who were so close to the tobacco industry that uh, when Tom DeLay had to go to Texas to plead uh, uh, about an indictment, plead with guilty or innocent on the indictment, he flew out on the R.J. Reynolds tobacco airline. They provided a, pri a, a private plane for him to go there to plead not guilty. They were so intertwined and so close. So, um, and yet, the hearing had such a big impact and passed a huge uh, shadow, which would, you know, propel many efforts forward even years later. So, Bill, maybe, I apologize, I forgot you were already in the Clinton administration at the time of the hearing, so maybe you can give a little bit of insight what it was like in there. But then looking forward, what was the impact of the hearing and how did it lead to the dominoes falling from there? Um, Josh, I want to note that um, there are many people in the room who spent hundreds of years working in tobacco control, and so we've got an incredible audience here. But also want to be sure that those of you who are in public health school now and are new to tobacco control, you're our next generation of activists that have got to carry this fight on. And I want to just take a moment and put these hearings, as Josh just said, in a historical context. Because they served uh, two purposes. They, they began the demise of the tobacco industry's sort of unfettered power in Congress and, and political power. It also opened up um, public policy opportunities, and while it took us years to get public policy change at the federal level, a great deal happened at the state and local level. And so, it, is it too loud? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so, 1994 is the series of hearings. Remember that 30 years earlier, 1964 was the first Surgeon General's report. So we got a, in the next year, 1965, 42.5% of adults smoked. 42.5%. We're down to around 16 now. So in that 30 years, there were some important steps that were taken, but the industry's power was really unparalleled. In 1969, there was a ban on TV and radio ads. In 1988, there was a ban on smoking on planes. Uh, in 1990s, youth smoking rates went through the roof. By 97, they were 36%. So there were a few victories along the way. There was increasing attention being paid. There were additional Surgeon General's reports about addiction. But 1994 was a watershed. And as, as Henry pointed out, it wasn't just that the hearing sort of broke the veneer of credibility of the industry. But we had the FDA commissioner testifying that the industry was intentionally manipulating the level of nicotine to make it more addictive. And importantly, FDA began talking about a pediatric epidemic because we now know that roughly 90% of adults who smoke started when they were 18 or younger. And when you, when you realize that in 94, um, that all began to come out, public opinion changed, and then there was a flood of activity. So in the 21 years since, let me tell you one of the things that have happened. In 1996, FDA, so we have 94 hearings. 96, FDA uh, published a regulation that eventually became subject of a Supreme Court opinion where, where FDA was uh, prohibited from proceeding with that reg. In 1998, 40 state attorney generals sued the tobacco industry uh, for Medicaid expenses from the fraud created by um, and harm created by tobacco. 
they settled for $206 billion over 25 years. In 1999, the Department of Justice sued the tobacco industry, Bill Schultz leading the effort at the Department of Justice and eventually won that case in 2006. In 2000, we had a little bit of a setback. We were trying to pass to the tobacco control legislation that Chairman Waxman had written that would have given FDA the authority to regulate the tobacco product itself. We lost by two votes in the Senate, but we had 58 votes, but we couldn't cut, cut off a filibuster. But, but the progress continued um, after that at the state and local level you all are aware that tobacco taxes have a tremendous impact on smoking. Uh, in 2002 alone, 22 states passed cigarette tax increases. We've had hundreds of to tobacco tax increases uh, during the last uh, decade. 2003, New York City went smoke-free. 2005, the World Health Organization um, um, organized and, and, and uh, got, had approved the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. States implemented comprehensive preve prevention and cessation programs. All of these things were happening at the time. They may have seemed slow, but when you look back on that decade, you realize how much was going on. But it was not product regulation. It was work that was going on at the state and local level. In 2009, it took us nine years to come back from the 2000 defeat in the Senate. But in 2009, with Chairman Waxman's legislation, uh, we finally gave FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products. It passed the Senate 79 to 17. I can tell you a decade earlier, we never dreamed we could get that kind of support. Passed the House 307 to 97. So in so many ways, the tobacco industry stranglehold, political stranglehold on public policy was broken, and you can see all the things that happened. The youth smoking peaked in 1997 at 36%. We're down below 16 now. So, and the public's attitude has changed dramatically. The, the, the one tax the public supports are tobacco taxes because they don't see it as a tax. So in so many ways, um, we, have, we have established the policy basis for really getting a handle on, to, on tobacco epidemic. But keep in mind, the industry has not gone away. The administration just negotiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. There's a very important tobacco provision in it that prohibits the tobacco companies from using trade tribunals to challenge countries' public health laws around tobacco. And there are members, including the majority leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell of Kent, Kentucky, saying that that's an unacceptable provision and he's not prepared to move the trade agreement forward. So the industry hasn't gone away, but we're in a fundamentally different position today that we, and we have the authority um, to regulate tobacco products, and we know that so many of our other strategies are working. And we're going to come to that a little bit later in the conversation. Great. It was a good introduction though, to the, the global issues, and I wanted to see whether, uh, Professor Cohen, you wanted to comment on the impact of the hearing and the subsequent cascade of events in the United States and how that influenced global tobacco control. Yeah, well, obviously the hearings had a huge impact worldwide, and a number of countries have been able to regulate tobacco products before the 2009 Act here in the United States. So Canada and Brazil are two exemplary countries, and, men, and the European Union and many other countries do uh, have the authority to regulate tobacco products. Most of them have uh, strong reporting requirements of what's in the cigarettes and smoke constituents. Uh, we have reduced ignition propensity cigarettes or fire safe cigarettes. So when people are smoking in bed and fall asleep, it doesn't cause a fire that um, kills others. And, um, and then I guess the other issue is flavors. So a number of countries do ban flavors in cigarettes, like the United States, um, but have gone further and ban flavors in other tobacco products, but so far all of those flavor bans have exempted menthol. However, um, there have been two jurisdictions now, uh, subnational jurisdictions, that ban menthol cigarettes. So the first was the Canadian province of Nova Scotia that imp implemented its ban earlier this year at the end of May, and the Canadian province of Alberta also implemented its ban just, uh, just a couple months ago. And we're doing some work. We have some students who went to Nova Scotia and Alberta to purchase cigarettes and see what the industry is doing in response to that ban because we know they always try to get around the spirit of the law. And I have, so 
um, they're, you know, regular packs of menthol cigarettes. And what companies are doing is instead of saying menthol on the pack, they're now saying green. Uh, so we've seen that before with light and mild and low tar cigarettes, changing <clears throat> the words that are on the pack. And um, you see on the cellophane it says new, and on the back it says a smooth taste redesigned without menthol. So, um, so we're trying to understand a bit more of how these companies are um, trying to get around the spirit of the law, and this is always a challenge that we have in, with many of our tobacco control provisions is trying to um, anticipate what the companies are going to do and, and prevent that or try and clean up the mess afterwards. Great, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I've been struck over, you know, the different public health jobs I had, how many times people came into my office and said, how can we make blank the next tobacco? How can we make, you know, some activity by a certain industry, or how can we make some problem like the next tobacco? And what they mean by that is not just, you know, maybe make them seem like the, the bad guy like tobacco, but how can we get the kind of progress that's been made on tobacco? And partly, um, people take it for granted that you can make progress on tobacco, but that wasn't at all the case when, when all this started, and it really was the, the work of uh, um, at these guys between P Professor Cohen and me and so many of the, the people here that I, I recognize, as Bill pointed out, who um, really started that cascade and created a model for public health more broadly than tobacco. So um, I want to move to the second phase, and we're, we're definitely going to have uh, a, a time for questions, but I maybe I'll, I'll pause for a couple questions after the second phase. Um, we're going to talk about um, the challenge around warning labels. Uh, uh, Professor Cohen kind of set that up a bit. I think we're going to, uh, I, I should say that there is apparently a um, campaign in 50 countries called uh, Don't Be a Maybe, Be a Marlboro, um, which is aggressively um, promoting the Marlboro brand at a minimum. Um, I think we're going to see here a response uh, to that um, from uh, uh, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and others. La campaña está diseñada principalmente para jóvenes, porque en el video se ven jóvenes. Jóvenes haciendo cosas con, con seguridad. No, o capaz que si fumas se te abre un mundo de posibilidades distinto a que si no fumaras. Y yo no sé qué tanto hubiese cambiado en mi vida si fumaba o no fumaba. Capaz era distinto o capaz era lo mismo, pero... Para mí es horrible que te lo vendan como algo que te hace... Bien. Claro, en ningún momento dice que te hace mal, onda, sí. y todos saben que hace mal. Los que fuman saben que les hace mal, yo sé que hace mal. Y por eso onda, no, no hago apología ni nada. No hay que decir tal vez, sino hay que decir sí y perseguir tus sueños. Te pone todo ese video como para que entiendas que si fumas mal oro vas a vivir así, vas a perseguir tus sueños. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with Professor Cohen here, that we're looking at some of the global ads. Um, do you think, uh, how would you characterize global tobacco advertising at this point? Is it different than what people see in the United States, generally speaking, and, and, and how? Yeah, in a lot of low and middle income countries where we do a lot of our work uh, at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, there is still a lot of advertising, like what we see with the Be Marlboro campaign. Um, but at the same time, and I think I'll just segue into the health warning labels, countries really are moving forward to require health warning labels on tobacco packs. So I don't know if we can just get up that slide very quickly, but in the I don't know if Scott can get that back up, but um, but many, there we go. So in the middle is a Marlboro Gold pack, it used to be Marlboro Lights, that is in the United States. So this is what our packs look like in the United States. Um, on the left is a Marlboro Gold in uh, from Italy, so it has the black and white text warning on the front and back of the pack, so, the, um, so that's one. And then on the 
right-hand side are Marlboro Golds in Australia currently, um, so it's for real. This is plain, plain packaging in, in Australia. So this shows the gamut of what the fronts and backs of cigarette packs look like across the world. And uh, even though our 2009 uh, Tobacco Control Act does require picture warnings on the front and back of packs, we're, not, we're still working on it. But most countries around the world, we have over 70 countries require picture warnings on their packs. And let me just say, some of those countries are Panama, Chile, Romania, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, Ukraine, the Russian Federation. I mean, it's all over the, the, where you can actually see um, picture warnings on cigarette packs. And as far as size goes, so there's a range. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a global health treaty on tobacco control, signed by over 170 nations around the world, sort of like our climate change agreements. So um, they require a minimum of 30% of the front and back of the pack being health warning labels. The country with the greatest proportion of the pack uh, of being a health warning label is currently Nepal, with 90% of the front and back of the pack being a picture warning. Thailand's pretty close behind at 85%. So the world is moving forward really rapidly. This is um, sort of positive sort of diffusion of innovation when it comes to health. So um, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Congressman, next. In the Thinking about tobacco control, how do you think about um, the importance of marketing both um, and counter-marketing? How did that play into um, some of the strategies that were used around uh, exposing the tobacco industry's interest in kids, for example, and, and uh, how important do you think it is for the United States to, to kind of move forward, and at least on the packaging side? Well, it's clear that the tobacco industry uh, hired the, the best in the advertising world. And that ad to encourage kids to think that if they want to be with it, if they want to take chances, if they want to live their life on the edge, that they ought to smoke uh, cigarettes is, is, is the theme that they've used over and over again. Uh, going back to those hearings, we didn't know what was going on within the industry. After those hearings, we saw a lot of what was actually going on. We heard from people who were doing research on nicotine addiction and how to manipulate it and get people more addicted. But in the boardrooms of some of these tobacco companies, they sat down and said, you know, Marlboro is doing so well in getting young people to smoke their cigarettes. We got to figure out a way to crack that and get the youth market. And thus came the Joe Camel ads. The Joe Camel ads were an attempt to get kids 14, 15, 16 years of age, younger than anywhere in the country where they would be allowed to purchase the cigarettes, to start thinking about Camel cigarettes. And so the, the R.J. Reynolds said, we've got to do something. And they market tested the, the Joe Camel ads in France to see if they would be effective in getting kids to smoke. So when we looked at what they said in the boardroom, they said, you know, if we can get them to smoke our brand early, then they'll be uh, loyal to us for the rest of their lives. They don't say that it might be a shortened lifespan, but they will get uh, the loyalty from that customer. They think so cynically in their ads and in their promotions exactly what they're trying to achieve. And we're always fighting a difficult battle because at first we wanted warning labels. Certainly if we warn people about it, they'll be educated and back away from it. The first warning labels in the United States said, warning, cigarette smoking may be dangerous to your health. Well, that meant nothing to most people. And we increased the, uh, the, the strength and, and power of the warning labels um, here and abroad, and it's helped but we shouldn't overstate that being as a, a solution because we're talking to kids who've been told by, by slick advertisement that if they want to be with it, if they want to be popular, if they want to be successful, they should smoke. And then they see a warning label of a, a cadaver or something. They, they, they see it, 
but they don't see it because the other advertising is so much uh, more effective. And then even in the United States, we have a problem, and I'm sure Bill Schultz is going to talk about it, the First Amendment. I always thought the First Amendment for free speech meant you could say anything you wanted about politics, about government, about policy. But the courts, and I always thought there was a distinction between free speech on those areas and free speech on advertising, on commercial statements. Well, the, the courts have whittled away that difference, and they think that it's the First Amendment to protect you, to lie about your products, and to, and, uh, and to say uh, all the other things. But if, you, uh, if, if the government imposes it, uh, that would be a violation of the First Amendment. Just an anecdote, as an aside, uh, a lot of what I did in my career was to work to get uh, uh, people who were denied their human rights out of the places where they lived. And one of the great crusades that was also successful was to get people in the Soviet Union to be able to leave, especially Jews who wanted to go to Israel. And I went to uh, Soviet Union a number of times, and I met with refuseniks, and they would smoke like crazy. And a friend of mine was with me, and he said, you're smoking so much. Don't you know it's bad for your health? And I said, eh, we heard that. They said, well, don't you have warning labels? And he said, warning labels? They're put on by the government. How could we believe it? <laughs> so always keep in mind that uh, the, the warning labels uh, have helped helped us, but they are not the end of the story. So I'm going to um, ask the, the, the two uh, bills to, to take it from there. Maybe Bill Schultz give a, a, whatever you feel comfortable saying on the First Amendment challenges in this area, and maybe, maybe Bill Corr to put that in context. Sure. And, and Congressman Waxman is right that First Amendment was adopted to protect political speech. And, was obviously central, that's why it's, it's the First Amendment. And for almost 200 years, the court said that corporations don't have First Amendment rights. It did not apply to corporations. And then in 1976, in a case actually brought by my public interest group, Public Citizen Litigation Group, called Virginia Pharmacy, and, and, and what it was is Virginia had a law that prohibited the advertising of drug prices. And we argued that, look, generic drug companies ought to, and, and, and pharmacists, pharmacies ought to have a First Amendment right to say what the drug prices are. And this was all to promote generic drugs. In that case, uh, the Supreme Court voted in favor in that case and said the First Amendment does cover corporations, and it has led to you know, what has to be described as, as, as just a disaster. Not that it wouldn't have happened eventually, but the, the court has really used this as a way to, to protect uh, commercial interests. And, it's, it's, and, and the industry has used it to challenge all kinds of regulations. So the dietary supplement industry was able to use it to challenge a standard that said, if a dietary supplement company is going to make a claim, it actually ha ha has to prove that it's true. It can't just be a little bit of evidence. It has to be enough to, to sort of carry the day. The drug industry, prescription drug industry, is using it to challenge the rule that says drug companies can't advertise about unapproved uses of drugs. And they've had some success. And of course, the tobacco industry um, has used it. I mean, the tobacco industry gives awards for papers on the First Amendment. I mean, they understand how important this First Amendment right is to them. and so. Um, in the FDA rule that we've referred to uh, in 1996, it had very uh, sort of comprehensive regulation of advertising, including ads could only be black and white and so on. And when the Supreme Court resolved that case, they didn't get to the First Amendment issues because they said FDA didn't have any jurisdiction. But one of the provisions um, in that regulation limited billboards uh, near schools. So it said you could not have a billboard advertising to a tobacco product within uh, you know, a certain number of feet within a school. And the tobacco industry successfully took that case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overturned the, overturned the Rhode Island rule. 
FDA then, um, uh, as a result of the 2009 law, the 2009 law picked up the old 1996 FDA regulation of advertising, and that's then, of course, been challenged. And the Sixth Circuit upheld a lot of, a lot of it. It held up the limit on sponsorship, the ban on light and low cigarettes, um, the ban on, on trinkets, free samples, but it struck down the restriction on colors. The, the, the rule would have prohibited uh, color advertising on the theory that it appeals to children, and the Sixth Circuit struck that down. The, 1990, uh, the 2009 law also told FDA to have graphic warnings on cigarettes, like you saw in, in Australia. And uh, when FDA promulgated that rule, it was challenged, and the DC Circuit struck it down, um, not saying you could never have graphic uh, pictures on tobacco products, but that, that the FDA's rule wasn't sufficiently tied to, to a, a beneficial result. And so I just say all this to say, uh, anytime the FDA is in the world of regulating advertising, and, and it's, it is, uh, and, and there'll, be, you know, there'll be another graphic warning rule, um, these First Amendment considerations are absolutely paramount. In the 21 years since the hearings, uh, as I mentioned, a great deal has happened. And one of the most important things that's happened is we have developed an evidence base of the things that work. And so for, you know, we can only talk about a few of them. There are people in this room that have worked on so many of them. But for those of you that are new to tobacco control, it's important, one of the most important things that's happened in these last two decades is that we have an evidence base of actions that we can take that we know reduce tobacco use. We are winning. It is tough. Oh, it will always be tough if you're working against the tobacco industry. They have unlimited resources. They have a monopoly. They have people who are addicted. And so they have resources that will fight us every step of the way. But just so you know the speed with which we've developed a strong evidence base, in 2007, the Institute of Medicine issued a report. Many of you have seen it and read it. And if you haven't, it's Ending the Tobacco Problem, a Blueprint for the Nation. And it basically lays out all the different tobacco control interventions that were occurring around the country. Excise tobacco taxes to raise the price, smoke-free workplace laws, prevention, comprehensive prevention programs, including counter-marketing, uh, warning labels, and, and prohibiting advertising. And, the things you've heard about, youth access restrictions, cessation treatment. There are many, many things we're doing today, and we're doing it successfully. But what the IOM told us that was so important, and it remains even more important today, is that we must sustain all of these activities all of the time. Remember that every year there's a new cohort of kids who haven't been exposed to all the problems with tobacco, who haven't heard the messages that we try to communicate. And those kids are ripe for the industry's advertising and marketing efforts. Secondly, the IOM told us there's more you can do. And it's about product regulation. It's about addictiveness. It's about the harm of the product. And the 2009 tobacco control law filled that void. Now we have to use it. But with the 2009 tobacco control law, and again, we'll get to that in the next section in more detail. That law allowed us for the first time to really regulate the product itself and what was in it, and um, particularly the nicotine and the harmful ingredients. And so the good news is that we've got a solid evidence base, that we've got um, activities that if we pursue them, it will continue to push smoking rates down. We've got to always innovate. You've got to always find new ways, and that's where the energy levels comes in, and that's why those of you in this room who are the next generation of tobacco control advocates, you've got to know that we've got the tools, but we have to use them. And so um, that takes us to the story of the product regulation. Yep, uh, that's great. And um, let me just say that there's a, the, this issue of the First Amendment is very important for public health, even beyond tobacco uh, regulation, and it's an area of uh, some, some work here at the school, and if people are interested, uh, please come, come talk to me too. 
also a, an area of interest to our democracy when the court declares that corporations are individuals and they could give unlimited amounts of money. That is distorting our campaign laws and our whole democracy as well. So a lot of the First Amendment uh, that's going to be already been affected by how the court looks at it and in the future as well. So um, thank you. Let's move to the uh, next section, which I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of my project to make sure we have time for, for questions. We're going to do this as the last section. So I'm going to ask people to talk a little bit about both. We're going to look at some new products and we're going to talk about the challenges in the future in the context of the, these new products. So um, why don't we uh, watch the videos? So I'll just say this from the state of California, one of their information campaigns. And the next one is an ad in response to that campaign from some vapor groups. Great. So um, that was an excellent uh, selection of videos to show a little bit of the, the what's going on now in the market for nicotine products. And as many people here may know, there are some very strongly held views on different sides of the question within the public health community. Um, I, I'd like to start with Bill Core to kind of give um, a sense of uh, how um, you see the innovation that's going on in the tobacco nicotine world playing out and, and what was the thinking in the way that the law was put together that uh, how would it would address it. I think the most important thing, Josh, that I can do is just to give you a very quick thumbnail about what the 2009 law gives us new and why it's so important. And, it, and you'll quickly understand why when it gets to these two folks and others about uh, how are we going to implement this law that it gets hard. First of all, um, the, the highlights of the 2009 law is that it allows FDA to require the elimination of ingredients that cause harm. So FDA can say, these, product, these, these ingredients can no longer be in a product going forward. It allows the FDA to change uh, or to require changes in the level of nicotine so that FDA has the authority to address the addictiveness of tobacco products. It's something that's got to be done thoughtfully and carefully, but FDA has the authority to reduce nicotine down to any level other than zero. It'll, it allows FDA to regulate the introduction of any new product, and it must meet a new public health standard, which FDA will be articulating. And all claims about tobacco products now have to be approved by FDA. So with the 2009 law, we now have the authority to regulate the product itself in many ways, and there's a great deal of, of excitement about the potential that these new um, strategies provide for us. Um, Bill will be talking about some of the implementation of some of the, the regulations pursuant to this, but all of this authority has to be um, implemented through regulations. It takes a while. Things are always takes longer. I say this having been at the department for six years and now I'm out. I can say speed up, speed up. Um, but th it's uh, the promise of the 2009 law lies in how we use these new authorities. Because when you add them to the things we, can, we are now doing, that we just talked about, the proven strategies that we're doing, we have the platform that's necessary to reduce the, the tobacco epidemic to levels that are manageable and eventually to, to it's gone. Great. Um, Bill uh, Schultz, you want to uh, react in any way to the, those videos, the challenge that FDA has as the market is shifting rapidly and maybe more generally how the department's thinking about uh, tobacco in the future. Yeah, well, I thought I would just, if it makes sense, uh, talk about e-cigarettes and kind of mm -hmm. the, the approach there. So the law, the new 2009 law covered cigarettes, um, and, but it said if FDA wanted to cover other tobacco products, it had to issue a regulation. And that's what's known as deeming, deeming other products within FDA's jurisdiction. And a regulation requires a proposal, notice and comment, and then a final regulation, which in this case will probably be followed by lawsuits because that's what, that's what this industry does. Um, so uh, there's been a, so FDA has proposed this and received the comments, and you know, the next step will be the final. 
um, and it will cover really all other, pull in all other tobacco products. It will pull in cigars, it will pull in hookah, and uh, what's been so interesting is it will pull in e-cigarettes. Um, the way the law was written, if you think about it, um, there are, you know, for cigarettes, they were obviously already on the market, and they were all what we call grandfathered. Uh, in other words, they, they all kind of stay if they were on the market. If they make new claims, those have to go through FDA. And if they make a major change in a product, that has to go through FDA and get an approval uh, on a pretty high standard. But if they make a little change, uh, the way Congress wrote it, it was modeled after the medical device statute, they can file a very sort of simple uh, application to show that their new product with their change doesn't raise new questions of, of health and safety. This is important for e-cigarettes because the, 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 the grandfather date is February 15, 2007. If e-cigarettes, to the extent they are on the market before 2007, they could be a predicate for a later product which could go through sort of the abbreviated kind of approval. To the extent they're not on the market on that date, then they have to go through a, a, a rigorous approval and show um, that the sale of the product is, is not going uh, it, to, it's not going to induce, increase the number of tobacco users um, and, 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 and not have really a, an overall adverse impact on the, on the public health. And, and I will say for e-cigarettes, if you divide them into flavored and unflavored, it's, 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 it's still not certain kind of where they fall on that side of the line. If they fall on the other side of the line, um, as I said, then they're going to be illegal in this, in, in, unless they come through. So FDA in the proposal, the proposed regulation said, to the extent that e-cigarettes are on the uh, closer side of the line, um, FDA as a matter of enforcement discretion would give the companies 24 months to file the application and then they could stay on the market until FDA made a decision. There have been lots of comments uh, on both sides of this, and FDA will have to kind of, it's got a lot of choices, um, decide what it's going to do, and that will be announced as, as part of the final rule. Interestingly, in the budget that just went through, and this is where the politics come in, um, there was an effort, a very serious effort, to limit FDA's authority over premium cigars and also change this grandfather date and my understanding, this was all just put together last night, is neither of those are, are in the final package. So uh, a, a great, yeah, just a tremendous, tremendous success. Um, in terms of sort of the global picture, just to just say three just quick things. I, I sort of, in, in the long-term effort, divided into three areas. Uh, the first one is initiation, and as Bill explained, that's really directed at kids, because if, if, if we can get people past the age 18, it's very unlikely they're going to, they're going to start uh, using cigarettes and other tobacco products. And my feeling is we've made a tremendous amount of progress there. Um, you know, everything from the elimination of Joe Camel to all the, the, all the tactics that have been worked have been very, very successful, as shown by the, uh, the, the, the reduction in initiation. The second area is, is quitting. Um, the studies show that a very high percentage of people who use cigarettes want to quit. Um, and um, that has to do, and, and, and you know, we have products out there, but they're not very successful. And in my view, there's a tremendous room for additional investment and work, you know, by pharmaceutical companies and others to develop products that can effectively and it's not just drug products, it's, it's, it's psychological methods and so on, but there are a tremendous amount of work left to be done there. And then the third area is what Bill mentioned, these new FDA authorities that give FDA the ability to regulate the product. And everything from reducing nicotine down to near zero to other methods that would uh, reduce the, uh, the use of, of tobacco products. And so, in this country, we have a lot of tools. We're limited by the First Amendment, <laughs> unfortunately, but we have, a lot of, we have a lot of tools. The rest of the world doesn't have the First Amendment, um, but uh, 
they've got a lot of challenges because the companies are uh, so focused on increasing their sales. There. Great. Thank you. And um, Professor Cohen, maybe if you would come. Oh, sure. Oh, as long as I get a chance, I don't know. Oh. Um, I think I'm going to defer to you now first, just so that it's, it's fresh. Yeah, I, I, I want to give you some, my some of my reflections. Uh, if cigarettes were just being introduced as a product in this country, we wouldn't allow it. Why would we allow a product when it's used as intended kills people? So it, it would be banned from being approved to be used and to be sold. We argued uh, that it's already so widespread in use. We have to look at other strategies to discourage people from taking up cigarette smoking and encourage them to give it up. That has been our basic premise. But when it comes to these other products, we wrote in the law that FDA could act. Uh, if they deem it a tobacco product, they can act under the law. Now, that law was passed in 2009. This is 2015. I'm glad FDA is going to act, and I'm optimistic they'll come in with a, uh, a wise regulation. But it has taken a very long time. Secondly, some people have fallen in love with these e-cigarettes to the point where they think that's a good thing to have on the market because it will allow smokers to give up smoking. Well, perhaps. We have no scientific data for that, but perhaps. But on the other hand, I believe that it becomes a gateway into cigarette smoking. And so there's a question in my mind whether we ought to leave it on the market at all. It's FDA's discretion to say that they can or cannot be on the market. But uh, if FDA is using its discretion, they ought to not allow flavors, because what are flavors? It's a way of attracting kids. And our whole efforts have to be to target, stop the targeting of kids to take up a product that's going to be harmful. So I'm, I'm very frustrated to hear people argue, this is a good thing to have e-cigarettes, to have it advertised widely, and to have people start using it that never smoked. Uh, I, I think, uh, and not to do anything about it for 24 months, it's already late because it's such a widespread spread use of this product by kids. Uh, so we're not for prohibition with cigarettes because they're already on the market. But why are we starting in with this product? If I don't know. I may be in, incorrect about what FDA can do. But whatever FDA could do, they should have done it already. Because every day and month and year that has gone by, products that we didn't even envision in 19... Uh, 94 or 2009 have taken off. And I think we've made it uh, more difficult uh, for us uh, for the future to stop the threats to uh, public health. So I, I'm looking forward to FDA doing the, the, the right thing, at least if they're going to leave it on the market because they think it had, does some good for some people, or they're going to leave it on the market because they don't want prohibition of a product that didn't exist as a problem before. And if they leave it on the market, it's going to become more and more of a, pro a problem. We need to figure that out now and uh, not wait for President Obama. 2009 to 2015, this administration that cares about this issue has taken much too long. I know you've got to go through regs and this and that and all the different agencies. But I, I, as an American citizen, I'm frustrated. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, that was good, lest any of the students here think that all the problems are resolved. <laughs> there, 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 there's a lot to do. Um, maybe before we turn to questions, I'll just ask P Professor Conus if there's anything you, you want to add at this moment, um, maybe with a little bit of the global context of this discussion, or you can come back to I'll it later. I'll make just a couple of brief comments, because I do want to um, hear all your questions. Just in terms of what countries around the world are doing around e-cigarettes. So we've been involved in a policy scan. Some people in the room have done a lot of work. Um, and we found that 61 countries around the world have some regulations on electronic cigarettes. Uh, over 20 countries ban all kinds of e-cigarettes. 
Uh, over 20 countries ban the sale of electronic cigarettes that contain nicotine. So they'll allow e-cigarettes without nicotine, but the ones with nicotine are not allowed. We have 14 countries, and this is all at the national level, so it, it, um, it has implications for the whole country. So 14 countries ban the use of electronic cigarettes in public indoor places. And we have, we've found over 30 countries that ban or, uh, or restrict the advertising and promotion of electronic cigarettes. So again, if you look globally, there's a lot going on around the world that we're looking at how to learn about the impacts of those policies, the, the positive impacts and the unintended consequences so we can um, learn from our neighbors about, um, about the impacts. And I guess in terms of just looking to the future, I'll just uh, say that I, I want to reiterate what Bill Kaur said, is that we have a whole suite of best practice uh, tobacco control interventions uh, that we know work and that we have to fully implement. Even clean indoor air laws, we don't have, we have many states who still don't have 100% clean indoor air laws in this country. So we, have, we still have a long way to go to implement what we know works. Um, but at the same time, we have to really address this major public health problem from a new perspective. And when I say major, we have nearly six million preventable deaths a year, each and every year globally, from tobacco products. This is massive. So we need to address this problem with an, with an urgency, with a creativity, and with a dedication that's commensurate with this public health problem. So I think what we need, we've got great structure with our Tobacco Control Act. We have to do what we already know works. We can regulate the product, but we also need some bold new ideas, some game changers, um, and evidence of how well they work and with whom and in what context. And so I think I would really like to see a public health solution lab that brings the public together, as well as experts, to really think outside the box, to be solution-oriented, and to develop what I would say are radical but realistic uh, high-impact solutions. So that's my challenge. Great. Uh, thank you. And um, let me take a moment to thank all the people who put uh, today together as we turn to questions. Uh, Nick Enquist in the back, Susan Morrow, and others. Um, Susan, you, looks like she has a microphone. So uh, let's go for some questions. Please raise your hand, and Susan, if you want to spot them. Oh, OK, sure. You got one right in front? Go ahead. Thanks very much. I, I'd be curious to ask the panel. Hey, what, could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm Ryan Kennedy. I'm faculty in Health Behavior and Society, and I work in tobacco control. I'd be really curious to hear from the panel your thoughts on ideas around tobacco product regulation. The FDA, with the Act, has the authority to regulate the product in terms of its ingredients, its manufacturing. Um, I, I don't think there's been very much done except the explicit removal of characterizing flavors. Um, what would be sort of a first, safest, biggest impact step in your mind in terms of what we should be doing? Is it nicotine? Is it removing um, constituents that are like humectants or flavorants? Um, there's lots of things we could do, but obviously the first thing that we, we do has to be a, a win. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? If anyone, anyone volunteering, I'm happy to, to, to take a shot at it too, but go ahead, Bill. Um, I think the reg that's coming is, is the first important step. I know that FDA, uh, Center for Tobacco Products, is doing a great deal of research. There are people in this room that are working closely with the center that could speak up about this as well. Um, I think that um, the agency has enormous new powers and it's got to use them carefully. There will be litigation over every single thing that FDA does. So um, it has definitely taken a long time, as Henry pointed out. I think we all know that and agree with that. Um, we've got to get it right the first time and we've got to use these powers. You know, when, in 2009, when Congress allowed um, FDA to reduce nicotine levels to anything but zero, no one had in mind that you could actually reduce nicotine to do it to a low level. I mean, it just, people didn't focus on that. Well, it's an incredible tool if we can, if we learn, you know, with science base how to use it so that we don't cause people to smoke more in order to get, you know, the, the, uh, the nicotine that they, uh, they're addicted to. So um, I think FDA has got an extensive game plan for going forward, and um, we just have got to, 
Get it all done. Hi, Kevin Daly, uh, American Lung Association. Uh, one of the game changers could be that Public Health England came out with a report saying that there's a 95% reduction in the risk, uh, the health risk, uh, for people who switch from uh, traditional tobacco to electronic cigarettes. And they have also now recently said that the national health system there will make um, <clears throat> Uh, an electronic cigarette uh, available as a prescription uh, for the first time because they believe that this is not a, a gateway to uh, young people's uh, use of tobacco, but is instead an, an alternative method for people to get nicotine and essentially move towards a tobacco-free society. What so, do you have to say to what is happening in uh, the United Kingdom? Let, let me... Uh try to answer that. Um, some of you may know I, I used to work at FDA and I've written about this topic a little bit. I think it's really important to understand the concept of how FDA is going to look at this question. And the key point to understand is that a product is not inherently great for public health with a few or, or horrible for public health. Maybe the cigarette is the exception that kind of proves the rule. Most products, it really matters how they're used, how they're put forward, in what context they're used. So I would run across people who believed electronic cigarettes absolutely were the solution to everything that ails the, you know, the, the country in terms of tobacco control, and that they would have this wonderful effect. Then you can run into people who think that there's just no way it could possibly have any benefit. The truth is there are a lot of products in American medicine, there are a lot of drugs that Benefits outweigh the risks in some circumstances, and the risks outweigh the benefits in others. And the key point that I would make is you shouldn't be lurching into a market, throwing stuff out there, not knowing whether you're going to be causing more harm or, or, or good. You could, you could believe, I'm not saying I agree, but you could believe that there's a dramatic reduction on a per puff basis and still have a product that causes an enormous problem if the way that it's used is it's an initiation track, like Congressman Waxman said, for kids to eventually be smoking cigarettes, right? I mean, may it, and there's, so the key is how it's used. And I think what, what FDA is going to be thinking is how do you regulate it in a way to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks and get evidence to be able to adjust that over time? So I, I think that you can see some countries that have really weighed in very hard that they think maybe that it's just a, the product itself is a great thing. I think that it is unclear and may well depend on how well it's regulated in that, in that gray zone so that the benefits exceed the risks. I think Joanna wrote something around the same time that I did with a similar viewpoint. I don't know if that's fair. Yeah, just to underline that, I mean, and, and this is the way the statute is set up. The idea is if you want to make a claim, I have a safer cigarette, you're entitled to want to do that, but you have to prove it first, and you, you go to the FDA with your evidence. Similarly, if you have a new product that you think is going to be safer than cigarettes or whatever, again, the whole idea is let's look at the evidence. And e-cigarettes are obviously complicated. It's obviously very complicated, and, and, and FDA's job is to look at the evidence, and as Josh says, you know, figure out what the right use is, but figure out whether... Um, in terms of the public health, this is a good thing or not. And if it's, an, if it's not, then it doesn't get approved. Lauren? Hi there. Um, my name is Lauren Saplicki. I'm a second year doctoral student in the Department of Health Behavior and Society. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity of having such a distinguished panel in the room to ask you all to speak briefly about um, the exclusion of menthol and the characterizing flavor ban, um, especially given the research we have uh, around menthol being related to initiation and difficulty in quitting smoking. Do you want to take that on? I mean, I, you know, Bill and I both worked a lot on, the, and Congressman Waxman too, on the legislation, but the original legislation didn't have any ban on flavors, and it was added. Uh, um, years before the bill was passed, but when the bill was in the Senate. And um, I think menthol wasn't included then because it, it was such a big part of the market, it just could have killed the whole bill. But Congress is very careful to give FDA the authority to issue a regulation that would change cigarettes, but including banning menthol. So that issue, I think, is now largely with FDA and and uh, it's, it's very much on the table. In fact, I think they, 
the bill actually required FDA to sort of start looking at this right away with an advisory committee, uh, which they've done. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Chris Bostic, Action on Smoking and Health. I wanted to follow up on what Dr. Cohen said in her final remarks about looking for the, uh, the new innovative approaches and uh, also take advantage of this panel and float a trial balloon. There's a bill before the Tasmanian Parliament right now. It's called Tobacco-Free Generation 2000. And it would basically raise the minimum age of purchase one year every year forever <laughs> and basically allow a cohort of people moving forward that would never become legally addicted to tobacco. Huh. This bill would not criminalize tobacco. There would never be police asking you what's in your pocket. It, they just hope that by in two generations later, the, the problem would be solved without ever taking a cigarette out of a hand, out of the hand of, a, of an adult. So I wondered what, what folks up there thought about that. What are they doing to prevent kids from starting? I mean, that, that's the key, right, is how, how do you keep kids from experimenting? And because they're, they're the ones that are. Sure, I, I think we have to keep in mind too that in this context, uh, Australia, which includes Tasmania, has gone perhaps the furthest of any country in right. fully implementing the FCTC. So they've already completely banned advertising. They've already completely banned flavors. They've banned e-cigarettes. They've done everything else. And one of the reasons that the Tasmanian problem is even considering this is they have not been able to actually eradicate the problem yeah. and that they were looking for the next step because there was really nothing else in the recipe to do to address tobacco. You know, just as an aside, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership provision would protect Australia from, because it, it's being sued by the countries and eventually possibly by the industry for the, act, for the tobacco control provisions they're implementing. You know, if anyone can figure out how to, I mean, the key, of course, is getting kids not to start. I think when you, you get to, some in the room may know these statistics better, but 18 and below, it's about 90% of initiation. But by the time you get to 26, there's no more initiation. And so if we can get people through their teen years and into their early 20s, you know, just as they're trying to do, you can have a whole cohort of smokers that just ages out and others hopefully won't start. I mean, the only thing, I, every time we look at this, a lot of times we overlook the black market. And I mean, for a provision like that to work, they, they have to, you, you have to think about how you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my, my reaction is slightly different, which is that the uh, industry for a long time was very successful with kids. There's been some very good counter uh, programming for kids. And oftentimes, there, you know, there's, there's evidence that when kids are educating other kids or empowering them, um, you can get quite a strong anti-tobacco effect. And I think some of the legacy people may be actually in the room today. Um, what, the, where I go when you say that is, wouldn't it be cool if that generation were really demanding it as they were getting older? And it wasn't just something that had to be worked on differently, but there was a different kind of political coalition that was coming together. Um, and this is sort of where tobacco becomes so interesting that it's not just about the policy, but it's also about how um, you can do community-oriented engagement around the policy to, to make a difference. I mean, I'll just add to that. I think along with that, Chris, is um, this idea that it really is empowering. And we are going to be the first generation to not get hooked on this deadly product. So it would be a feel of we are going to make a difference. We are you know, the inheritors of this earth, and we're going to be the smartest, smartest ones to date regarding this product. So I think there is exactly that sort of idea that goes along with that type of policy. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave Dobbins. I'm from the Truth Initiative, um, formerly Legacy. OK. Um, and actually, that is the, the exact theme of our current round of Truth ads, that, this, that in America, this generation can be the generation that in smoking, um, and that we should finish this once and for all. Uh, I, I really just picked up the mic to say thank you, because it is, I think, sometimes hard to realize what momentous progress has been made. And while there's still a ways to go, um, I, I just wanted to remind everyone of the monitoring the future numbers that came out today. In 1997, um, the use among uh, uh, 12th graders, which is a number I find particularly relevant for the 18-year-old initiation fact you brought up, Bill, 36.5% uh, of 12th graders used a cigarette in the last 30 days. In 2015, 11.4% did. 
Um, and the overall rate of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders blended together is now 6.7%. Um, I, I would uh, add a cautionary note. We do see that products like cigarillos and hookahs and even e-cigarettes are, are being used more frequently than they've ever been used before. Um, I think it's not, a, it's not hard to draw the conclusion that the incredible vacuum of regulation and the really disappointingly s slow pace, no offense to, to those of you that are working on it, has really opened up a gap to take away a little bit of, or maybe even quite a bit of the wins we're seeing. But we know if we do the right thing, we stick to it, we can end this problem. 11.4 percent, that's remarkable. Thank you very, very much for your work. Well, and back to Legacy and all the, the Lung Association and all the other organizations that are here that for 25 years, 20, at least since the 94 hearings for sure, have absolutely led this effort to bring smoking rates down. And a school like Bloomberg, this school, and the mayor himself have just uh, been incredible contributors to the success that we've had so far. Well, as we wind down, I think I'm going to ask Congressman Waxman if he has any uh, final thoughts. I guess uh, we can be proud of the progress we've made, and we should feel good about it. Uh, I, I guess what has always driven me is uh, good, better, best. Let your good get better, let your better be the best. And uh, we've got to continue to use all the strategies all the time uh, to get rid of the uh, epidemic, the deadly epidemic of uh, cigarette and use of these kinds of uh, uh, drugs, whether it's cigarettes per se or a new delivery system for it. And so I congratulate everybody here who's been involved. You're obviously all here convinced of this position. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be here today. But I, I, I think uh, I've never felt more the connection with the, uh, uh, the, the name of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health being the Bloomberg Johns Hopkins Public Health School of Public Health because of the uh, cr crusade that uh, Mayor Bloomberg has taken on as well. Great. Thank you. Well, I, I want to also thank the Institute for Global Tobacco Control staff, Rebecca Shaleen and Asim Khan, for their, their help today. Um, I want to thank uh, Ellen McKenzie as the Chair of Health Policy and Management, and uh, David Holgrave as the Chair of Health Behavior and Society for um, their work in, in sponsoring the Centennial Policy Series, and Frances Henkel for her contribution. Um, I also want to um, thank uh, the uh, Bill, Bill Core and Bill Schultz for coming up here, spending time in a very uh, b busy time to uh, share their perspective, their history, um, and I uh, want to thank Professor Cohen for organizing today. And then I want to thank everyone, and particularly Congressman Waxman, for the incredible platform that they built in tobacco control that is really uh, uh, the next generations to move forward. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking everyone here. <laughs>